announcing the arrival of Associate Professor Tuan Haji Amran Muhammad Zaid, Deputy Dean Development and Industrial Networks, Faculty of Engineering Technology, and the Honorable Datuk Wei Chuan Bang, Founder and Managing Director, Red Tone International Berhad. Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly be upstanding for the Bangsa Johor Anthem and the National Anthem. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sehati sejiwa. A very good morning and a warm welcome we bid to all. My name is Anim Zalina Azizan and I am very honoured to be a Master of Ceremony this morning. First of all, allow me to extend the warmest welcome to Associate Professor Tuan Haji Amran Muhammad Zaid, Deputy Dean, Development and Industrial Networks, Faculty of Engineering Technology, the Honourable Datuk Wei Chuan Bang, the Founder and Managing Director, Red Tone International Berhad, Associate Professor Dr. Afandi Ahmad, Dean, Faculty of Electric and Electronic Engineering, Senior UTM, UTHM Officers, Respected Researchers, Students, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the University, Tun Hussein on Malaysia, I would like to thank all of you for being here and welcome to the CEO at Faculty Program today. We, have, we are very honoured to have the privilege of kicking off this fourth session with the Honourable Datuk Wei Chuan Bang in our beloved university, the Faculty of Engin Techno Engineering Technology together with the University and Industry Relationship Office have been instrumental in helping to organise this event here this morning. Well done to the committee members for their unconditional commitment for this particular programme, especially to Dr Lam, Dr. Lam Hong Yin from the Faculty of Engineering Technology who put a lot of his effort to ensure this program will run as per plan. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with the speech by the Honourable Dato, again, allow me to address the objective of this program. The CEO at Faculty Program is a part of the initiative by the Ministry of Higher Education to intensify the participation of the industrial sector as part of the national higher education system through experiences, sharing and expertise from the industry leaders. And this program also has introduced the tagline called Learn from the Pros, 
All of us here may have a further details of information from the website ceo.myin.my. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned before, this is not the first time visit from the Dato, Dato, the Honourable Dato Way. This is already fourth time visiting to our university. So allow me to refresh the topics that has been discussed by the Honourable Dato Way before. The first visit Dato has been talked and shared on the journey of the entrepreneurship. The second time, the topic of the entrepreneurship, how to raise funds, was the interesting subject that has been presented by the Honorable Dato. The third topic was about the business models for the real revenue and profit. Hence, the, this time around, the Honorable Dato will talk and share on, on the entrepreneurship, finding your first customer. This sequence or flow of the topic is a very well-designed structure to be followed for those who are really interested in a business study. So please, don't miss the previous presentation and today's talk so that we may capture all the real experience from this expert and have a review on that video from ceo.myin.my. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, for the first time, for the fourth time, I would like to call upon the Honorable Dato Wei Chuan Bang, the founder and the managing director, Rector International Berhad, to deliver his speech. Yeah. All right. Um, good morning, um, Prof. Amran, uh, Prof. Fendi, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Well, very happy that we are meeting for the fourth time today. Uh, as introduced by our very capable MC just now, the first session we talk about the idea of entrepreneurship. How do we generate the idea? By looking at the problems out there. The bigger the problem, the bigger is the opportunity. So we went through the whole process in the first session. The second session, uh, before the second session, the idea and also we talk about what kind of a team that will be suitable and how do you position the, the product or services in the market. And then in the uh, second, second uh, talk, we then explore the idea about how to raise funds. Because if you have an idea already, where do we get money? First of all, are we willing to come up with some money? Family and friends, angel investor, venture capitalist, corporate investor, and subsequently raise the fund from public, like initial public offering, that means list the company, or issue bond, that is a debt uh, kind of uh, instrument to raise fund. Beside that, also tap into any incentive that government may give, like grants, and loan and so on, right? So we talk about funding. We have idea, we have the team, we have the competency, now we have the, the fund, that means enough money, not a lot, not necessarily a lot, but enough money. Then third, we talk about what kind of business model. Is that B2B, business to business? Is that B2C? business to consumer, all right? So we went through that. Different models and how do we generate revenue out of it? Now we have the model already. We need to be able to execute the model. Execute the model means we must get customer to come in. Now how do we get real customer? So today we're going to talk about getting the first customer. When we are able to get the first customer, it also confirms that indeed what we are providing has got real value and from there, it's easier to get second and third and subsequent customers. Now, I'm thinking today it is also a bit special because 
Besides talking about this topic, we have about one half hours, right? I would like to use one hour to talk about this topic. And before that, I would like to also share the idea about the digital life of which I gave a TED talk a few months ago. It is also available in the TED X channel. So I would like to encourage everyone as well to learn some of those ideas and also some of the new findings through the TED, TEDx channel. Have you heard of TED Talk? Yeah, TED Talk is a good format. Usually it's within 10 to 20 minutes and you get different resources who has got different expertise to talk about that subject. So because it's actually in a certain bite size, which is actually very easy, uh, 10 to 15 to 20 minutes maximum. So usually in a short time, it is packed with a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and um, a lot of wisdom. So I really like to encourage uh, everyone here to develop and inculcate the habit of picking up the TED Talk on a regular basis. Even make it like part of your, your routine if you can. Let's say, you know, every Monday and Friday that you want to spend half an hour just to kind of get some ideas from the TED Talk, right? Okay, now this is actually one of the companies that I co-founded uh, last year. So that's why I'm also wearing the T-shirt just to show that it is a picture that we took just outside the office. It's a Tuka office. <clears throat> and at that point in time, it was still a hot period for Pokemon Go. You know Pokemon Go? How many of you play Pokemon Go? How many of you don't play Pokemon Go? You don't play, all right. Is there any Pokemon Go here? No, right? Yes or no? Yes? In libra library? Library. You can catch some. Okay. Uh, because I think Nintendo, they use um, what they call that, a Google map, right? They geo-release some of those <laughs> Pokemons, right? So it may not be available in everywhere, but Malaysia was actually, it is one of the target countries. So we should get it in, in most of the city area. But I'm not sure about Badu Pahat. I'm not sure about UTHM. But you've seen some. Alright? So when you use a Pokemon Go app, so happened that we wanted to take a group photo. But one of our colleagues just turned on. He said, hey, you know, at this garden, there's this Pokemon here. So then he took a, po a picture. So suddenly you find that there is this Pokemon monster, which is actually a virtual life together with the actual real-life people. So I thought, hmm, this triggers some different thinking. We thought that digital life is something, it is digital, like nothing to do with me. Suddenly this picture, give me an idea, hey, digital life and us, sometimes we, we cannot separate them. So it's actually part and parcel of our life. So when I compile this, um, the TED Talk is also, you know, to incorporate this idea. But I'm not going to talk about Pokemon Go. So this is the only picture you see Pokemon, and that's it. Just in case you want to know more about it, you will be disappointed because I'm not going to talk about <laughs> Pokemon Go. Can I use this? Yeah. In the... Uh, the header doesn't turn up. No, uh, before? Previous? Okay, next. Next? Yeah, all right. Uh, in fact, for this session, what I really like everyone to maybe have in, the, in your mind, if, if you can, very strong impression is about this 2NN. What is 2NN? Somehow the header doesn't show up. The power of two and n. Two means double, right? The power of doubling. 
you may be aware of a power doubling, doubling effect. Have you heard of Morse law? Morse, M O O R E S, right? It's one of the co founders of Intel at the early days. Intel that produced the processor. So he talked about Morse law. I will go through Morse law in a short while so that we kind of uh, have a stronger impression about Morse law and the power of doubling. And then N here is the power of network, network effect. And another N is actually nature. When we talk about technology, certainly this will be the three most important forces that propel the development of technology. And the, your, the attendees today, I understand, are, you're from two faculties, right? The faculties of the engineering technology and also electrical engineering, right? I, I used to also study in the electrical engineering uh, before in UTM. So now, these two are very practical courses and directly relating to the power of 2NN. So next, what is 2NN? Mm, okay, now in terms of the, the next 30 minutes or so, first of all, we will talk about the awareness of digitalization. People talk about digitalization. What is a digitalization? The technology trend? And we would like to get everyone here to have more interest in this. You are already interested. You are already in this, the right faculty, the right course. And more important than that is this for us to think about how to use this di digital technology for enablement. How, do they, how would technology enable us, enable community, enable businesses, enable country? So we want to think along that line. Because it's all about application, right? When we do engineering technology, it's all about application. Even electrical engineering also in in the case of UTHM, they are all about application. It is not about pure research, right? So enablement is important. So when you en enable, there are also another aspect of disruption that may happen to other industry, to the lifestyle, to the community. We, we go a little bit more in this area. And also how the lifestyle can be renewed, community renewed and businesses will have the new ways of doing businesses in the renewal process. Uh, and lastly, it's for us to decide, do we want to take action or do we want to watch this? Next. So you see that individual, we, we are user of technology, user of smartphone. How many of you don't use phone here? Don't be shy, it's okay. I know of uh, sometimes there are reasons why we don't use phone. Is there anyone? I, I don't know. No smartphone. Yes? All, all have. Wow, this privileged group, but it's expected. All right. So this is also a community because individually used, and then you have a community UTHM. You have community in Batu Pahat, you have community in Johor, you have community in Malaysia, you have community in ASEAN. Suddenly you find that the community grow to become part of a country, part of international setting. Likewise, if you have one Kentucky Fried Chicken shop, KFC, it's actually one restaurant. But you have the whole food and beverage it becomes an industry, whole F&B industry. How many restaurants are out there? There are perhaps 10,000 restaurants around. So one restaurant and one industry, 10,000 restaurants. Right? Again, it is part of the much bigger uh, setup in the, within the country and also in the region and globally. Because you see Kentucky is avail available in KFC is available globally, right? McDonald's globally. And who brought McDonald's to Malaysia? Do you know that? You don't know? Okay. Is someone from Batu Pahat? Yes. Winston Tan. Yeah. He was an insurance salesman, but very persistent. He wanted to bring the franchise to Malaysia. 
So every day he wrote a letter and sent to the headquarters of McDonald's and introduced himself, I am Winston Tan, I am very interested to do a business, I'm very willing to commit to this, I'm willing to work hard, I'm willing to do a very a whole long list of things. And he knows that he was nobody at that point in time. And because it's from Bhattu Pahat, so I better relate this story. Right? <laughs> and then, because nobody responded, he wrote another letter. And every day he wrote a letter. Can you imagine when in a headquarter, sitting in a headquarter for one year, for two years, for three years, you find consistently this joker keeps sending letter. you would really have to pay attention. This is a true story. So because of that, finally he said, okay lah, okay lah, I grant you, I grant you the, uh, the master franchisee for Malaysia. So then from there, he developed the business, he grew some number of outlets and he sold the business back to McDonald's. Right, got the first pot of gold. From first pot of gold, then he went into multiple businesses. Then he grew from here. All right? So the first pot of gold is actually from McDonald. Uh, before the first pot of gold, the first pot of silver was from the insurance sales. He was willing to do sales. He didn't have a privilege to attend UTHM, no university degree. Right? So, with that secondary school education, he can speak English. He thought that that can actually give him some foundation to learn things. So, he became insurance agent. His bosses in the insurance industry, so I have some contact. So, I know that he's been working very hard. So, he earned a pot of silver, not gold yet. But then, McDonald's was the first pot of gold. So anyway, not to digress too much, right? Because you look at digital technology will impact everyone. Because it's, can you imagine McDonald? Can McDonald operate without technology? Everything from the, the way they market, they, they have a lot of uh, digital marketing today, right? But even in the process, the point of sales, the analysis of the customer behavior, all these are done digitally. Smartphone, good news, real news, fake news all come to you. Right? Do you know that, let's say if you really look at all your messages, be it through Facebook, through WhatsApp, whatever, how many percent of those are real news? How many percent of those are junks? How many percent of them are fake news? Fake is actually worse than junk. You know? Junk are like irrelevant uh, information. You know? uh, sometimes people talk all kind of nonsense, right? But it's, it's still like frivolous, but not fake. But do you know how many percent are fake? It's getting higher and higher. So it's also very dangerous because when you have fake news, when you have uh, not sometimes not just fake news, sometimes it's an injection of uh, totally uh, destructive ideas that it gets into us, right? Because we believe in fake news. We believe in wrong ideology. We believe in some of the wrong uh, belief. Then it can actually lead us into a path of disaster as well. So, like it or not, digital te technology, we can choose not to care for it, but the technology will actually reach out to us. So we better take note of this whole development. So social, socially, how it affects us, community. You find that these days people have instant culture. People expect immediate response. Just, I think, not too long ago, five years ago, ten years ago, people can go for vacation. Nobody disturb them because they don't have phone. They, they, some may have roaming and all this, but because roaming is expensive, they say, I'm going overseas. Don't call me. Right? So you can have peace of mind. But today, because you're connected everywhere, so then you cannot have real rest. You cannot have peaceful time. Why? Because you're bombarded all the time. And the expectation is this, especially our millennial, <laughs> that you can multitask at the same time 
chat at the same time, work at the same time, also search information, so in multitasking. And when people chat, because you have to respond, right? So it is actually getting into this instant culture. Not just instant nodal, but instant culture when it comes to communication and response. Now, it is such a new, new reality. Uh, a lot of people feel that it is very uncomfortable, but the millennials are very comfortable, so there lies the, the gap. Because if, let's say, more senior people feel that, why is it so, so urgent that I must respond immediately? But if we don't respond, suddenly you never know that we, we may miss out on some opportunity because this is how they expect it, right? The multitask, the values also uh, is affected not by the traditional family values. It's no longer family values. And today, the peer influence is more than ever. Not just peer influence, it's also global influence. Because you cannot think of an app, communication app, that is totally only local. Unless you have one UTHM app, only open to UTHM. But you look at Facebook. Facebook started as an application to connect the alumni right, of the Harvard and subsequently universities. And it subsequently it grew to more than the alumni of the university. So it becomes like part of everyone's life. So the values, when people say something or people comment on something, when they are short video clips, it changes our perception about many things. So the values has actually changed. It has become a lot more global. It has also become um, very split in many ways because people tend to identify with a certain group. Now the danger <coughs> is that when we only identify ourselves with a certain group, and then the group has got a lot of similar message, right? It deepened it deepen the belief, it deepened the information, it deepened the knowledge. And people just talk about that only. They don't talk about any other thing. So there are also so-called interest group, right? In your chat group, in your Facebook group, in your whatever, Instagram and so on, right? Uh, of course, I've touched on breaking the time and the distance. <coughs> Uh, digital industry, there have been a lot of debate this day that automation could replace a lot of jobs. Economies, politicians, they all have been struggling to find ways to address this. After what we see that robots in UTHM, I think there should be some courses on robotic, on automation. <coughs> and it is uh, inevitable that many of these areas of automation will take away jobs. Do you watch the US election recently? Do you see the debate? Did you see the debate that the current president say he want to bring jobs back to America? Right? Are you aware of that? That he wants to build wall so that the immigrants from the down south will not come into America? Right? And he wants to also stop that kind of uh, trade arrangement so that people will still have the job. Otherwise, manufacturing job will go to the low-cost country. Right? Have you read that one? The job loss, it is estimated that in US, it is not about losing the job to other countries. In the future, a lot of Americans will lose the job to robots, will lose the job to artificial intelligence. So we will watch. And no matter how they try to debate about keeping the job, wanting to recreate the job, we're going to see a lot of job loss. So in the next five to 10 years, <coughs> if you're not careful, it can cause a real major imbalance because of joblessness and so on. It can cause a lot of imbalances in the society. And legal law, I think, is a big headache. Did you see the recent launch of the Digital Free Trade Zone? Are you aware of that? 
How many of you have heard of digital free trade zone? Ada tak? Tak ada. So I see only like 5% of the hands. It's scary. It's very, very scary. Because we are all studying in university. This is one of the most important development in Malaysia in the area of digital economy. Alibaba, Jack Ma came last week and together with the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has actually announced the establishment of the world's first digital free trade zone outside China. So what does that mean? The key word is outside China. What does it mean? That means China has been practicing different pockets of free trade zone, like Shanghai free trade zone, Tianjin, Tianjin free trade zone, Shenzhen free trade zone, and all this. That has actually seen major take up of the trade. Right. So digital free trade zone, they identify their location around KLIA, whereby the logistic, warehouse, payment, and facilitation of trade all happen there. So because of that, it is support, supposed to support the new digital economy in a form of e-commerce. People can buy, sell easily, clear goods easily. So theoretically, when people order something from any part of the world, within one, two, up to three days, they can get that good. Right. So it's actually a powerful initiative. So we must, we must be aware of some of this important development. Now, why, why is it there's the need to have a digital free trade zone? Why can't we? Have, why why can't uh, anyone who operates e-commerce in Batapahat also be called a digital free trade e-commerce? Can or not? Can or not? Possible, right? possible. What is the implication from legal point of view, regulatory point of view? Today, you go to any shop, you buy something, assuming it's one ringgit. I bought some uh, pretty, uh, sweets just now. One pack is one ringgit. It's printed there, 1.06. What's that? 1.06. Because GST, right? 6%, right? So, why is it the digital free trade zone is important? Because if you want to sell to the world, they don't want to pay tax because they don't consume in a country. It's called a GST, Goods and Services Tax, when we consume in a country. So, now, when you want to do business around the world, it is about just the trade, about the goods and services. It's not about paying tax locally. Because when you buy from here, you have to create job, you keep the profit here, you pay corporate income tax, or you may get tax-free status, right? But you hire people. When you hire people, then you create jobs. So these are the positive effects that's intended in the digital free trade zone. However, other countries will find it, oh, that means you buy from e-commerce, you don't have to pay tax. If you go to the shop, you pay tax. Bear in mind, in some countries, GST is as high as 21%. So if you buy $1,000 worth of products, you have to pay $1,210. That's a lot of money, no? Right? So you find that the law and regulation around the world, they are not synchronized. So people take, take advantage of that so that they can get more advantage uh, when they don't pay tax. So this is where digital technology certainly caused uh, uh, some of the major concern about application of law, which is not uniform around the world. It's not uniform. Regulation, not uniform. And also sometimes very difficult to enforce certain law. Like say, for example, if there is this cyber attack of a banking system. The entire maps, you know maps, money transfer, you will go to ATM, you can draw money, right? The network behind that is called maps. Malaysia Electronic Payment System. 
if there's a cyber attack from somewhere that caused the whole network to come down, that will cause serious loss of productivity, time and effort and all this, you know, and loss of confidence, loss of reputation of the banks and, and so on. It's actually quite a major disaster. Can you imagine when fun cannot flow? You cannot draw money. You cannot go and buy things. It disrupts your life, right? So it's a crime. It's a cyber crime. But when an attacker comes from overseas and you don't know where is, the, where is the source of the attack, how do you enforce the law? So this is uh, to give us the awareness that indeed technology can bring a lot of things. However, the changes will actually affect us positively and negatively. It's not necessarily just positively. Right? Be aware of that. So because we have to make choices after this. Next. Uh, Josie, next. <laughs> Alright, coming back to technology. I've shown some of this picture before. You know the end, right? How many times the end can carry the weight? It says there 5,000 times, right? For human, can or not? Is it possible for human to carry something? If I want to carry this rostrum, this is about 50 kg I can carry, lah, right? If it's uh, 100 kg, okay, that's one and a half times my weight. Can I carry? Still may be possible. If it's 200 kg, three times my weight, can I, can I carry? I think usually it's not possible already. That may be the limit already. Even the, no, the weightlifting uh, champion of the world. How many, how many kg? 200 kg, yeah? 200 kg. But the guy is so 100 kg. La. It's two times. La. Right? But the ants can carry not 10 times, not 100 times, not 1,000 times, but 5,000 times. If you, your weight is 10 kg, 5,000 times you can carry 50,000 kg. 50,000 kg means 50 tons. You know, that's equivalent to how many trucks of weight. Is it possible? Not possible, right? Okay, let me ask you. Next. Ho, oh, have you watched this movie, Six Million Dollar Man? <laughs> this is an old uh, TV drama, but it was an old fiction back then. You change bionic hand, you change bionic leg, right? So because of that, bionic arms, you can carry something 5,000, uh, no, 50 tons. So suddenly you find that, hey, men, can, men and women, uh, I use men, means men and women, uh, can be like an ant, you know? We can carry 5,000 times of our body weight. How do we do that? With technology. That used to be the fiction. Drama is becoming real. You do robotic arm? You do robotic arm? Robotic arm can easily carry more than that. Right? So it's no longer a fiction. It's real. And it doesn't have to be fitted on human being. It can be standalone robotic arm. And today is one of the most commonly used robotic application. Bionic arm. Next. Yeah. So coming back to 2 and N. Alright, I just before I illustrate the power of two. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. Next. Assuming you start with one unit. One unit, let's say, if you have one dollar, one ringgit lah, and then every day, every day, you increase your sales, every day, increase your sales by one, uh, by double. That means you double every day. So, first day, compared to yesterday, you double, so you have two ringgit, right? So, the third day, next, you have four. Another day, uh, first, second, third day, okay. Fourth, fifth day, 32. Sixth day, 64, right? Still small, right? Seven days, 128. Eight days, 
two five six. Nine days, five one two. Ten days, hold on. If you double every day, just ten days, it has grown one thousand times. Can you see that? Ten days, it's grown one thousand times. That's not scary enough. Eleven days. That's 10 days, right? 11 days? 12 days? 13 days? 13 days is actually 8,000 times. 20 days is really 1 million times. So the power of doubling is extremely scary. And technology is going through that pace of change. Why? Most law... Most law says that every 18 to 24 months, the, con, uh, the what they call the density of the transistor can be doubled. The power of the processor can be doubled, 18 to 24 months. And this started in the 1960s. 1960s until today, already 50 years, right? Just now, just now you saw that 10 years from that point in time, it was already 1,000 times more powerful. 20 years from 60s, it was already 1 million times more powerful. And now, it's actually a billion times more powerful than when transistors were invented in the 60s. So because of that, the smartphone that you have in your hand, it is actually more powerful than the mainframe that was around 30 years ago. Just because of this, Moore's Law, the power of doubling. And then they thought that, okay, Moore's Law hit the bottleneck. Hit the bottleneck that it can no longer double every 18 to 24 months. Because when it comes to the physical limit of atoms, protons, electrons, it comes to the physical limit. And that, that was... The belief that it will taper off. However, just a few years ago, scientists, physicists found that they are able to break through some more in, in these physical particles. With the breakthrough, they project that the Moore's law will continue until 2050. So today is 2017. So 2017 to 2050. You're talking about another 33 years. 33 years, and every two years, the power double. The power double. And they also found that with the network effect, it's not just about power doubling. The network, let's say social media, there, there are a lot of study about the first 1 million users of everything the first 1 million users of radio took 50 years. The first 1 million user of television took like 15 years or so. The first 1 million user of mobile phone, the mobile phone, huh? it also took quite a few years, something like uh, 5 or 8 years or so. But that was the normal phone, no. Normal mobile phone. The fixed line, it took like very long time. Fixed line, it took like 20, 30 years, right? To have 1 million. And after that, a lot of apps, right? Suddenly you find that a lot of apps. First 1 million, it takes 3 days. 3 days, you have 1 million. So because of the network effect, social media, you have all the interconnectivity. So the network combined with this is actually double exponential. I also how, don't know how to describe the power of double exponential, right? And the third thing that forced a lot of new invention, forced a lot of new technology, is actually nature. Why is it nature forced this? What is nature? What is nature? When you think about nature, what, what, do you, what comes to your mind? You think, oh, nature is like environment, right? Mother Nature. Okay. Yes, climate change. To understand about 
earth to understand about changes of climate because it's going to affect our existence. Climate change will cause depletion of water supply. Climate change will cause depletion of food. So to find the solution, how do we overcome food shortage? How do we overcome water shortage? Then there have been a lot of energy and research into solving that problem and that propel the new technology into that area. <coughs> so I'm actually confident that the world's greatest problem that we can think about can be resolved with this kind of technology. Not today, but projecting forward. Not only the mother nature, human being, uh, you know that we will grow old. You will grow more mature and you will grow old and one day you will grow out of the world because you're going to die. Everyone throughout the entire history, you cannot find one person who don't die. Now, but the wish to live is actually a very powerful desire, the desire to live. So even from the early days, Emperor Xing Huangdi wanted to find the kind of uh, whatever medicine or herbs that can extend his life. He has actually commissioned his people to go out there and a lot of them settle down in Japan and it becomes Japan today. So Emperor of, of those days, 1,000, 2,000 years ago and, and even until today, people desire to live longer. So you find that there are a lot of research in gene, in stem cell, along DNA, a customized medicine, and use all kinds of uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, type of uh, treatment method in order to cure disease, in order to reduce, slow down or slow down the aging process. It is because people want to live longer. So this is also part of the nature that we try to fight. So then we use a lot of technology. So power doubling, power network and power nature culminate into a lot of new invention and technology. This is the main point. Next. So, technology, how do we see technology? There are three different parts of constituent, so to speak. Constituent means areas, alright? First of all will be <coughs> the technology provider. Next. Uh, next. First is technology provider. People who develop technology. Hey, this is actually not working, right? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Never mind. So there are companies that develop technology and the technology, of course, you talk about smartphone, you talk about artificial intelligence, internet of things, 3D printing, the 3D printer, right? So I just quote a few examples. There are a number of technology providers and these are the people that will fully tap into the Moore's Law because they always see, okay, how do I make it better, faster, new breakthrough, new connectivity, all right? So technology provider, they are the direct contributor towards using this tool and end. So they will experience the exponential effect in terms of the capabilities of the technology. So like artificial intelligence, for example. Today, we say, oh, what is artificial intelligence? Actually, I have uh, one of those companies that is doing the purchase advisor. Where people say, oh, uh, I have three children and I, I drive from Badapahat to UTHM to do my lecture. So what kind of car is suitable for me? And my budget is below 80,000 ringgit. Right? By asking this question, the AI equivalent of the application called Whoopi, then would it give a recommendation? Oh, the suitable car will be these five models. Then actually it helps you solve your purchase problem, you know. 
Otherwise, you need to look through all the 20 different brands, compare the specs, check the prices, go and test drive. It's very time consuming. So this is actually a very simple application of AI of which it has got natural language processing because you key in your requirement or you say your requirement and it understand that it has got machine learning capability it has got the expert system that look at the entire database of cars the specs and understand the products and then return the result to you but just in case that Whoopi doesn't have enough information it will invoke the dialogue manager. Oh, uh, what about your boot space, luggage space? Do you want big, medium or small? So the dialogue manager will also come on board. So this, to me, is like an artificial intelligence at a child form. It's like 10 years old child that is still not very capable yet, right? This is a state of the so-called artificial intelligence. However, because of the power of 2NN, in the next two years, in the next four years, in the next 10 years, it's going to become 1,000 times more powerful than what I described to you today. So then you can discuss things, you can debate, and it can think, it can find a solution, it can give you a lot more ideas. So artificial intelligence can be very scary especially combined with robotic that is a good go pick up the glass for me you may say that it's a it's a it's a fiction again 2 and n it's going to be 10 times 10000 times more powerful in just 10 years right so it's going to happen it will happen we want to embrace that one 3d printing now we begin to see in some construction, a lot of walls, a lot of uh, blocks, they use 3D printing so that they don't waste material. And this is going to change the 3D printing tremendously. Uh, robotic, Internet of Things. I have uh, a friend who run one of the largest plantation in Malaysia. Not just in Malaysia, Malaysia, Indonesia combined. So he said now, one of the most important tasks this year is to find the solution how to overcome the foreign workers issue because they hire 30,000 foreign workers to harvest, harvest the palm oil, the palm fruits, right? Uh, this is one company. Of course, you know, many other companies. That's why we have a lot of foreign workers to do this labour job, right? He said, now this year, he said, I'm looking for a solution that can automate this part. It's a combination of some robots and so on. So you, you are expecting, you know, once the solution is mature, in the next two, three or five years, in one company, 30,000 workers will be gone. If they don't have to do the harvesting of the fruits anymore. It's scary. Yeah. So it's happening. Next, that's technology provider. If we can be a technology provider, that's well and good. If we are not a technology provider, we want to use technology to enable business model. You see, this uh, price line, people want to book uh, their travel online, right? You go to Agoda, you go to price.com. These are all companies or website under Priceline. So many of these, like even Tuka, to do online sales of discounted cars, is actually to use technology to enable business model. You look at Airbnb, Alibaba, you want to get medical opinion, the serious, serious sickness, you want to get medical opinion. These are all using technology to enable the business. So these people don't invent technology. They are they using technology to enable their business. So the second constituent is about how do we deploy technology to enable us. 
So I see that in the context of UTHM, I think a lot of thinking can be channeled towards how to apply, how to use technology to enable our lifestyle, enable our businesses. Next. And lastly, we are the user. Of course, individual, all the social media, communication tools, we are the user of this. And for businesses, we use cloud services, we use digital marketing. So the third constituent, if we don't use technology to enable us, we use technology just as a user, right? So having seen these three constituents, next. You know technology, the pace of movement will become even faster. The reason is this. Progressive countries, I see Malaysia is one of the progressive countries. We, we have a lot of grants for R&D. And in fact, we also encourage research universities. Right? We are one of those progressive countries, however, we are still very far behind because our allocation is still very small. Right? The advanced countries like US, like Germany, like China, like Japan, uh, Singapore, many other countries, they put a lot more money to do R&D. And what is the, what is the, let's people say, oh, uh, you know, like China spent 3% of the GDP on R&D as a country. What is the meaning of 3% of GDP? Anyone knows what is the, what is the GDP of China last year, 2016? Anyone has an answer? Who got the answer will have 10 ringgit reward. What's the 10 ringgit? Bring the 10 ringgit. Who has the answer? What's the GDP of China? Anyone? You have a smartphone? Yes? 12 trillion. Is it verified? Certainly it's in trillion. It's not in billions. It's not in hundreds of billions. What was the Malaysia GDP? Malaysia GDP is about 200 billion US. About lah. You know, because our currency is so fluctuate so much. Huh? We drop so much. It used to be more, but now ringgit is less already. So it also reduced. So I do not know which number to take. Lah. I just simply roughly about 200 billion. Right? That's Malaysia GDP. What is China's GDP? Hello? Huh? Sorry again? 9.24 huh? trillion. Okay, anyone has any different number? Yes? 16.1 trillion, all right. Uh, correct or not? Okay, who has different number? Who has different number? I, I saw some hands here. Other that? GDP of China. 9.24 trillion. Okay. USD, yeah? 2013. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. I was asking last year again, 2016. Huh? Okay, the back there. Sorry? 21 trillion. 21 trillion. All right. We have different answers. No. From 5 trillion to 9 trillion to 16 trillion to 21 trillion. So, can someone show the, from your search? 21 trillion, where do you get a search from? Google, okay. Is that for 2016? 2016, huh? Can you show? Sure. Bring, bring your, your smartphone here and show us. Uh, show only doesn't mean correct, no. 
Don't be too happy. Okay. All right. Is this what currency is this? Are you sure? Okay, choose this one. Uh, anyone has a different number? Wow, how come we don't have the, the answer? Uh, because my impression is not 21 trillion. My impression is 21 trillion could be, <coughs> could be a renminbi. Could be a renminbi, yeah. All right. Uh, looks like nobody has the right answer. Can someone confirm that what you have retrieved is indeed uh, a number that is from a credible source? Anyone? <laughs> because it's, I think I just want to get to the relative numbers for us to, to know. Sorry? 11 or 12 trillion US dollars, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, doctor. Yeah, it's, it's about there. It's about there. 11 or 12 trillion. Uh, US is something like... Uh, US is like 50% more. It could be like 18 to 20 trillion, right? What's the concept of trillion? How many zero become behind one trillion? How many zero? One trillion, let's say now it's 11 trillion, right? Okay, one trillion, that's about one trillion. How many zeros behind that? Yeah? Smilan. Smilan is billion. Smilan is billion, all right? So trillion, Papa? Yeah? 12. 12 zero behind that. All right. So now you have 11 and then 12 zero behind that. Can you imagine what number is that? It's called 11 trillion. 3% of that, brother. 3% of that. Okay, for your information, if it's one trillion, one trillion, one percent is one percent is ten billion. Right? So if ten trillion, one percent is one hundred billion. One hundred billion dollars. So three percent will be three hundred billion dollars. Alright? So what's uh three hundred billion dollars? 300 and then 90 at the back there. That is the amount. Yeah. Uh, how much is the operating cost for whole year for UTHM? Do you know that? About 200 million. Thank you, Prof. About 200 million ringgit. US dollar about uh, divided by you no know, divided by four, right? so about fifty million US. Fifty million US is entire operating cost of UTHM compared to three hundred billion. Fifty million only six zero. No? This one is nine zero, and then you have another three hundred in front. Because of that, there are a lot of investment in R and D. The money will propel a lot of new invention. Not only that, there's a, a lot of VCs, venture capital, they are also spending billions and billions into technology sector. So every year, new findings that will accelerate. Again, Moore's Law will come in. 2NN will come in. So I want to impress upon you, 
that in the next five to ten years is a completely different world. That's why you're going to see autonomous vehicle, cars without drivers. It is real. It's happening. The incorporation of this technology is real. Autonomous vehicle and many other things. Robotic, artificial intelligence, 3D printing. Next. Okay, so without going too much into other examples, I just want to kind of highlight that in every sector, let's say government, how do you use technology? Security today, without technology, no country can manage the security. Because today, security, just not I use the word cyber attack, right? There are all kinds of intelligence without security, without technology, security cannot be established in any country today. Uh, of course, service enablement. Healthcare, a lot of breakthrough in the biotechnology. A lot of breakthrough. Uh, IoT, we are starting this for the old people to care for them using a smart watch. Uh, we are developing, I mean, one of our, our, my companies is developing that because we are targeting China market. In China, out of 1.4 billion people, there are more than 200 million people more than 60 years old. And there are a lot of them who stay in the kampong. The children work in a city, right? And many of them, they stay alone. When they stay alone, they need help. Sometimes they fall. So, solution is actually using technology. So, the smart watch for old folks, it has got the health information like heartbeat and blood pressure and blood sugar. Reminder when to take medicine. Geofencing, because some old, you know, every day 50 people missing. Every day, because of geo, geomancia, hilang, uh, apa dia, ingatan dia. De dementia, Alzheimer's, the old people, they walk out from home, they don't know how to come back. Every day, 50 people missing. So, that's why there's need to have geofencing with a watch. If at all, the old folks step out of the geofence, let's say you, 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 you design such that if they step up more than 500 meters, then the alert is sent to the children. So the children will know where is their location and then get someone to assist. All right? And on top of that, uh, also um, fall detection. Because old people, many of them get into difficulty when they fall. They fracture here, they need some emergency care and so on. And sometimes strokes. So old people fall. And when they fall, that often will cause a lot of complication. So again, use Internet of Things technology. We are looking to solving that problem together with Dr. Mazlan, who is also uh, the industry advisor of uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering. Yeah. So healthcare a lot. Of course, education, you are looking into distance learning using artificial intelligence to help to coach. So, you know, a lot of jobs of teachers, of professors may be at risk. No worry. Because we would have a lot more creative uh, kind of dimension. Right? Sales, e-commerce, AI. AI with a big data would know where do you go, which, what the kind of topic you talk about on the internet, what do you like, your preference with your age group, this is what your friends are wearing, so, you know, with all this big data analysis and artificial intelligence, it's going to introduce to you what is it yet you need, right? And also, in the future, the shirt, no longer you just buy something through mass production. Because mass production is big wastage. You produce one million pieces of the shirt, you may sell 700,000. 300,000, you chuck away. So it wastes a lot of earth resource. So in the future, it's going to be on customized costume. Your computer with a camera, with your avatar, it takes your measurement, and then your measurement, you choose the design, it's sent to the 
cutting machine, sewing machine, then you get your shirt sent to you. So that's happening. I'm aware that Adidas is already starting to do this. Right. So when you have leaders in this area, more will come. Transportation, I talk about autonomous car coming. Construction, I use the example of 3D printing. Agriculture, ah, the plantation, can robots that can harvest. Entertainment, gaming, wow, virtual reality. How many of you have been to virtual reality game center? How many? No, not yet. Huh? Okay, not yet means, is there a market or no market? When you go to Africa, you find that everyone don't wear shoe. What is your conclusion? That means no market for shoe or a big market for shoe? Big market for shoe, right? Okay. Now all these people here, I mean including all of us, if we have not been to a virtual reality game center whereby you put on headgear, you have all the devices, you are really inside there playing the game as a real game because of virtual reality. The moment you experience that, it's going to be addictive because you are inside that environment. Right? So it's a huge market. That's why people like Facebook bought up quite a few this uh, virtual reality company. Google bought up quite a few virtual reality companies. Huawei bought up virtual reality companies. It is actually going to be a big thing coming to our life. Gaming is a big thing. People need entertainment. Home entertainment and also entertainment center. Robotic in manufacturing, robotic in services. I've seen the example of robots being used in the hotel to usher people. So robots say, ah, yeah, uh, you know, you walk to the hotel, where's the toilet? Ah? So the robot will show you, uh, this toilet is this, this way, and then walk you, or you know, go with you. Show you to the door. So it's happening. So a lot of people, they think you can do a part-time job in a hotel. In the future, susah juga. <laughs> Smart home, uh, I think it's okay. Lah. Next. Ooh. I've given a lot of examples of how technology enables individual, community and businesses. Uh, next. And it also disrupt a lot. I think you have a lot of talk about disruption. I, I need not go into this, right? Next. Renew. Okay, now renewal means we are going to enter a new state whereby people no longer need to go to, let's say, one office. It can be a flexible workplace, flexible hours for individuals. So it's actually a, a renewal of the new way, uh, new lifestyle uh, forward. And in a community, you find that crowd is actually a big thing this day. You need help, you throw into the internet, the crowd will come. People who don't know you will come and help. Right? People need, let's say, blood of certain type. They just throw into the internet, throw into Facebook, then they pass and pass and pass. Suddenly, you know, all the solutions come. People don't have enough uh, money to pay for the school fee, university fee. This in the Western country is very common already. Oh, please, everyone give me $1 because I need to pay my university tuition fee. Donation came. $1 only, ma, I give. La. Crowd. <laughs> the power of internet crowd. Very powerful. Of course, businesses will see a new a renewal of the new structure. Industry will change because, let's say, even taxi service. Used to, you got to call or you got to wait at the roadside. Now, you use app. Maybe in UTHM here, you don't use taxi so much. Huh? But in a city, again, taxi service is really one a necessity. Around the world, all the big cities, is a necessity. Right? This day, taxi that don't use app, either Grab or Uber or the proprietary app, they will die. So all will renew into the new form of the industry practice. Next. Okay, this is the end really. So digital life, are you in or are you out? Next.
a lot of, just to invoke and provoke more thoughts. Can we be successful without technology? It's a question we need to ask ourselves. Can we be successful? That means achieve some re good results. La. That, that typically how we look at success, la, right? But more importantly is this, can we be happy without technology? Cannot, cannot. People say, technology made me very unhappy. Can I not? But a lot of people say, without technology, I'm very sad. There's a, uh, what they call it, an experiment done. A punishment for the children. A teenagers, punishment for teenagers, right? You, which one is more severe? You keep, uh, you you keep the uh, the smartphone away for one day, versus you deduct the monthly allowance by half. Which one more severe? Yes. Which one more severe? Kata. You have say pocket money, you know, teenager, teenager, pocket money. Katakan you have one hundred ringgit, right? One hundred ringgit. You also have a smartphone, right? Okay, you make a mistake already. The punishment is this: I either take away fifty ringgit. One month you have only one hundred ringgit pocket money, you know. I take away fifty ringgit, fifty percent. Or I take away your smartphone for one day. One day only. Which one do you think they are willing to accept? Who say they are willing to give $50? Who say they are willing to give their phone for one day? <laughs> the result is the other way around. The result is this, they are willing to say, okay, take my money, but you know, I want my phone. They are willing to sacrifice a lot of things. So, because they feel that without the smartphone, they are very unhappy. So, it's a different state. We have to ask this question ourselves. Right. And imagine this extent 10 years down the road. Uh, technology has caused divide who are not digitally educated or not willing to learn can be marginalized. So, be very careful. Right. Next. That's all. Next. What do we do? Do we observe? Do we embrace? Do we innovate? Next, just the life. That's all. All right. Uh, I wish you success in digital life. <laughs> uh, hang on. It's okay. Huh? Setengah jam lagi. Oh, okay. So you because you got another PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh. Uh, remember, I want to talk about how to find the first customer. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you still fresh? Uh? This is about like one hour and 20 minutes since you've been sitting. Are you okay? Ah? Okay. Who, who wants to take a five minutes break? Datuk cannot. Datuk cannot. If you take that five minutes, they're gone. So you better you're continue. Gone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go. I have a very, uh, this is a very wise advisor. <laughs> I'm going to take that advice. Right. Don't okay. give them five minutes. Okay, continue. so but if you okay, need to ease yourself biologically, you know, you can go to a washroom and come back on your own. Uh, but you're going to miss out very important uh, this part of it. Uh. Okay, uh, Josie, can we load up the how to find the first customer? Next. Okay, finding your first customer. All right. Even though we are in the uh, engineering faculty, right? Whatever we do, sales or marketing is always part of our life. Part of our life. Especially if you're an entrepreneur, this is a big part of an entrepreneur's life. Right? Entrepreneur doesn't mean that, it, you know, I'm an engineer also, no. I'm also an entrepreneur. So it doesn't mean entrepreneur means you you. You have nothing to do, then you become an entrepreneur. <laughs> Entrepreneurs often they are because they want to solve certain problems or they want to capture certain so-called 
opportunities because of new ideas. So they need to put in extraordinary effort to make things happen. So quite often, entrepreneurs are not those who cannot do anything else, who can do a lot of things, but they choose to be entrepreneur. Next. So let me ask sales and marketing. Who can tell me what's the meaning of sales? Anyone? We talked about it earlier. What's the meaning of sales? Ah, the back there. You show me the 21 billion. What's the meaning of sales? Huh? Sell something to? To someone. Uh, sell something to someone, make profit. Okay, very good. Thank you. I want to decide. Any representative? What is marketing? What is marketing? Anyone? Yes? Yeah? Promote. Oh, okay. Any, anything else besides promote? Huh? Sorry? Strategy. Ah, oh, strategy. Anything else? Okay, very good. You got promote, you got strategy. What else? Any other word? Sustaining. Yeah? Advertise. Okay, very good. Uh, what else? Okay, these are good words that will form the difference between sales and marketing. But I want to put it in a very light way so that all of us maybe have an idea. But without this, this one, uh, no discrimination, no sexism and all this. Uh, it's just illustration. Next, sales means you chase one girl at a time. For guys, they can understand. The girl also can understand. You chase one girl at a time. All right? That's sales. One to one is called sales. All right? Okay? Simple, right? Okay, what is marketing? Next. Marketing is how do you promote so that 10,000 girls fall in love with the same guy at the same time? This must be a film star, lah. Right? Sometimes you know this is very kacha star. Huh? Jackie Chan. That's why you have 10,000 girls falling in love in one star at the same time. That's called marketing. So it has got promotion, it has got strategy, it has got uh, whatever terms that you use, advertisement and so on. Can? Yeah. So now, oh, suddenly we know that, oh, this one is to talk to one person. This one is, I don't, I don't talk to one person. I don't even talk to 10,000 people. Or maybe 10,000 people want to talk to me. So that's marketing. Next. So marketing, someone says strategy just now, right? So marketing, because it's about big group of people, right? Usually, there are push and pull strategy. Push means a push, tolak. Pull, tarik. Pull and push strategy. What's pull? Market pull means you attract. How do you attract people? Usually, people say, oh, low price. Why e-commerce can attract people? Because on the net, usually you can find the cheapest product. Usually, yeah, I use the word usually. Not always, huh? usually. And most of the time, it's correct. Or you have a unique proposition. You have something that's special that can give the value to the consumer or to the customer. So how do you pull? So people say advertisement, right? Next. So you either advertise, people say, hey, above the line. This is an industry term. Above the line, above the line means you have to use mass media like newspaper or TV broadcasting or billboards. You use PR, public relation. You organize press conference. You invite reporters to come and write about you. So that is also part and parcel of marketing. Of course, these days people use social media. Next. They are also below the line. That means it's not seen by a lot of people, but it's in store. Let's say, for example, you go to the supermarket, you find that there's some poster. Poster, that is called below the line because it's in the store. In-store marketing, marketing collateral. 
brochure, sometimes you have brochure, you have posters, you have a uh, guide and all this, right? This is very traditional, right? But anyway, it's important for us to know that this marketing strategy or pool, it has its, its uh, function. If we need to use a marketing pool, means we need to spend a lot of money. No money, no love. People don't know you. So, okay. Spend the money, then maybe attract a lot of love. Lah. All right, next. Or, the other one is a sales push. How do you push products? People say, can we push product out? This month, I want to push like 10,000 units out. Why do you see, why do they use the word push the product out? Why is it they call, I want to let the people pull my product, product to their home. They call it push the product out. Why? Because it is through the sales force, the army of the sales people that is motivated by commission or the sales margin. Uh, there's a saying in, in Chinese, lah, you know, that if you have money, you can cost even the ghosts and angels to move. <laughs> right? So if you use incentive or money, use incentive, even the ghosts, not just human, no. So that's why it's even more than human. Even the ghosts also will move. Even the angels also will move. All right. So now, how do we do that? Next. Uh, usually, people tend to have a direct sales people. They have sales team. And very important is to be able to structure the commission correctly. And give them training. Give them a lot of tools. Give them a lot of knowledge so that they can sell effectively. They can sell effectively and they are motivated. I keyword motivated by the commission. Let's say, I'm sure in the campus, some of you would have the experience of doing sales. If this is a product, uh, mineral water, your cost is 50 cent. You sell one dollar. Do you think you have energy to sell? Yes or no? Yes, some energy to sell. But 50 cent is okay. Lah. You need to sell a lot of water. Right? If people use drink water every day, then it's still a good business. But just to sell one is not attractive. Lah. So, but if you sell one car, right? Because how many of you have cars here? How, how many? All right. Uh, maybe like 20%. You buy cars, right? The car salesperson, the car salesperson, selling one car makes 2000 do, do you think the person is very motivated to sell you a car? Yes or no? Yes, right. So that's why you see sometimes, why is it the salespeople? They follow up very closely. Hey, when can I see you? Oh, this one, I can do some, this for you, I can do that for you. Why is it that they behave to be so friendly, so proactive? Do you think they are born like that? Yes or no? Maybe, yes, that, that's true. Some people are very helpful, naturally very helpful. They like to serve people. There are people like that. More people are actually molded by the, the behavior are molded by the incentive or stimulus. Right? So push strategy is to kind of uh, modify the behavior, inject the energy to push your product out. So apart from direct sales people, very often we have the distribution channel. That means reseller or the distributor who again are motivated by the margin. And they also need training. So that's why the transfer price is very important. Likewise, the retailers, next, or your franchise, they can also sell. They can turn this into a business that they can generate. Why is it that, you know, 
one Mac- McDonald's franchise, uh, people need to spend one million ringgit. And people are queuing up to, to apply to become franchisee. Why? You need to invest one million ringgit to be a franchisee. Is that a small number or big number? Big number, right? Yeah? Huge number, not just big. It's a huge number. But why is it so many people line up wanting to become a franchisee? Because they believe that they can make another five million ringgit. Right? Yeah. So it's always relative. So franchise, and then of course, multi-level marketing. Many of you may be familiar with Amway, la, New Skin, la, New Upper, new, Old Upper, banyak lagi lah, uh, all the multi-level marketing, right? Avon and whatnot lah. Why? Why is it people are actually in that multi-level marketing? Is it because the product is super good? Yes or no? Product must be good also lah. But more than, more than product is actually because I want to find people to sell for me so that I can get the overriding. Right? So this becomes the primary motivation. Okay, so we know the difference between pull and push already. Let's see. As a business, what do we do? Next. I think this is a key word. Every Entrepreneur is a sales person. You cannot say that I have my best product, I just sit here and the world will come. They will not come. There are many companies that have the best technology, best product that have gone bankrupt. A lot of them. Why? People don't come simply because you have good products, they need to know or someone need to push to them, someone need to introduce or you need to do a marketing pool. Right? Because of that, if we want to build sales force, I'm just giving suggestion because I would like you to think of some products that you would want to develop and then sell in the marketplace. If you have a salespeople, you want to pay salespeople 5,000 ringgit. You know, a lot of salespeople, 5,000 ringgit is a normal pay. Uh, we say, okay, now I, I take pride. When I graduated, I, I was an engineer. All right? And I also have overtime because HP, at a point in time, as an engineer, if I need to actually do the service, uh, over weekend and after hours, I'm also paid over time. So I thought I was very well paid. But why is it that when I look at the salespeople, uh, I'm already well paid, they are better paid. So people sometimes feel very imbalanced. They say, hey, you know, I have knowledge. This guy don't seem to, they have different knowledge lah. But they have good income. Why? Because the, commi- the commission can scale up. If they sell three systems, then they make 5,000. If they sell 10 systems, suddenly they make 15,000. Whoa, okay. It's quite different. Huh? Because commission will actually pile up. Right. Now, how do we get 5,000 to start with? There's a need to motivate the salesperson, right? So usually, out of that, 5,000 account managers means salespeople. Uh, is usually, they want to give a better title to salespeople. So I use an uh, industry term. Right? So when you see a business card, someone say, I am a, a sales, uh, no, I'm an account manager compared to I am a sales executive. Right? Sales executive sounds, first of all, you're going to sell something to me. People don't quite like it. Right? And then executive is very low, right? So people call, okay, account manager. I am the account manager. I want to sell you the instrument for your faculty of engineering, right? Uh, so, okay, their actually base pay is 60% of 5,000. 3,000 base pay. And then when you can do three system sales in a month, you get another 40%, which is 2,000. 
But if you sell 10 system, you get another X thousand of the income. So this design will push the person to sell more and more. Right? It's common, this kind of structure. But sometimes it's a technical sales. It's like a consultant. A consultant then don't, don't sell some real uh, so-called hard product because it's based on technical knowledge. Right? So then it can be 90-10. 90% is a base pay, but when there's a target that we achieve, another 10%. So that also motivate. Then usually there's a sales target, sales quota, and also you may want to consider providing the stock option. When you do well together, I'm going to give you some shares, stock option. So if you imagine, this talk is about entrepreneurship, it's about startups, that when you have a company, you want to sell products. When you sell products, you want to incentivize the people, including considering some stock option for the people or key people as well. Okay, you notice here, I'm, I'm putting the mark here, which is B to B. Uh, so I'm going to focus on B to B sales. B to C has a lot of marketing, a lot of channel and distribution management. So I'm going to put that aside. Today, I just focus on business to business. Is that okay? All right, next. So business to business. Okay, let's say you have a... What is it that you, you want to develop? Let's, give me a product you want, to, you want to... They can sell to the business. Anything you want to sell to another company? What's the big industry here in the, in the bottom part, near bottom part? Okay, that's uh, for consumer. Okay, crepe, huh? Okay. Do you think UTHM, UTHM buy crepe? Okay. Not just student, not just uh, the, uh, our staff, huh? But university as an uh, organization buy crepe. Ada tak? Not frequent. Okay, now you have Jamwan, Jamwan, all these things, who buy? In a Jamwan, you also serve crepe, ada tak? Okay, that means it's a business that buy. It's not individual, it's not consumer that buy the crepe. Alright? So now, crepe, assuming it's your product, crepe is a product, okay? There are maybe about 1,000 factories around Batu Pahat area. There are also another 1,000 businesses of you know, car trading companies. They sell uh, all kinds of things, right? Different business. You, you don't want to sell to consumer. You only want to sell to business. Why? Because in business, one thing, how, many, how much is it? Okay, one kilo, 15 ringgit. If you sell to one person, usually the person buy one tin, kan? Do you think the, the person will buy 50 tin? No, kan? Yes or no? One person buy 50 tin? No. No, this, this guy must be a bit not right lah, to buy 50 tin. So usually one, one person will buy one tin or two tin. But do you think when UTHM has a jam one, do you think UTHM will buy 50 tin? Yes, right? And the answer is more than that. Maybe 100, right? Likewise, a lot of companies, if they have that, let's say they have a, a, a pantry, a coffee corner, if they buy for their own use, they only buy one thing. But if the company has 20 people, they have a small pantry, right, for 20 people, how many things do you think they buy? They may buy five or ten. So now, remember, there are easily 1,000 of these kind of companies around Batu Pahat, easily 1,000. So if the position is to sell to B to B, then you want to have salespeople to then target UTHM, car distributors, factories, 
and their manufacturers, can, right? And many other business outlets, you sell crepe. So to do that, let's say in a factory, who do you sell to here? You have the owners, the shareholder, your board or director, you have the executive committee, senior management, your managers, you have an engineer, and then you have all the production workers and customer service and so on. Those who sell crepe, who do you sell to? In the case of UTHM, who do you sell to? Do you go and see our VC, Prof. Ahead? Yes or no? No, okay, no. Do you see uh, Prof. Amran? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I thought, I thought he's uh, running the faculty. Now you're asking him to buy a crepe. Okay. Do you think you, you look, go and look for Prof. Afendi? Sure. Or do you think you will look for the organizer for the Jamwan? Who is the organizer? Is it Pendaftar? Not Pendaftar, right? Usually which department? Which department? Sorry? Okay lah, katakan jamuan yang terbesar di UTHM lah. Ah. Ah, led by pendaftar kan? Okay. Uh, under pendaftar, ada purchasing department. Okay, now we are talking. Right? Because in UTHM, there are how many thousand people? You cannot simply look for anyone. You want to look for at least the purchasing manager who reports to Pandafta. That's the difference. That's why in a B2B, it's actually a very easy sales. You can, you can sell 100 tin of crepe, one go. You look for one person. It's actually the purchasing manager. Of course, you must know what's the need. Ah, the need is this. We are going to have the Hari Tabuka or we are going to do a celebration of the how many anniversary? 20 anniversary. Alright? Or we are going to celebrate the welcoming of new VC, for example. <laughs> Alright? There are all these reasons why people want to have Jam One. It's a need. It's the need to buy food, buy drinks, and organize things. So we look for that person. So that's why even though in a company, sometimes we say, oh, factories, this factory is big, like 1,000 people. Who do I talk to? Actually, you talk to the person who really need that product. Even though 1,000 people, sometimes it is good to talk to the CEO directly at the top level. Sometimes it's to find people who is in charge of that function. It can be production, it can be engineering, it can be HR, Let's say, for example, you develop a software to track quality of a production. Who do you sell to? Do you sell to HR manager? Hello? You have a software that track the quality of the production. Do you sell to HR manager? No, no, no. Okay, no. Do you sell to the... Do you sell to... Um, the CEO. Yes? Maybe, right? Okay. Do you sell to the finance head? No? Finance head is going to approve the budget? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Eventually, it will come to the finance head. But the most important person is the quality assurance manager because you are going to help him do his job better. Right? Without this, for example, only, uh, without this quality management software, then they need to do all the manual tracking, they need to do all the statistical analysis, very tedious, very tough. Right? His life is actually not very good. So when you sell the kind of solution, 
then he can have a better life, better tracking of quality, right? Next. So now you know that in the B2B, it is important to sell to the right people whom you can solve their problems. Like Jamwan, the headache lah. I need to buy oh, all the food lah, makan lah, nak cater lagi lah, minuman lagi lah. Headache is my problem if I organize, kan? So I want to buy. You say, crepe? Oh, very good. How much? 15. Can I discount a bit? 14. Okay, can already. 100. Right? Yeah. So now, do you want to sell to consumer or you want to sell to B2B now? B2B better. Huh? Which is B2B is a, a lot easier business than people think. But we get scared. We say, wow, to sell to that factory, 1,000 people, I don't know who to sell to. In reality, a lot of businesses, they start off by doing B2B. In fact, businesses, they are the bigger purchaser than the consumer. You look at operating expenditure of UTHM. You already know that. Actually, we buy a lot of things. Even your gardener, you want to be a gardener for a house or you want to be a gardener service for UTHM? Of course, UTHM. UTHM, just a landscaping contract. It'd be worth millions. Right? So that's B to B. It's not B to C. So let's say if you are a new nursery and gardening services, who do you sell to? Yeah, gardening. You, you have a lot of plants, you have a lot of services to do. Who do you sell to when you come to UTHM? Do you look for Prof Amran? No, you don't, right? Who do you look for? Huh? PPH. What's PPH? Uh, you look for the facility department, right? You look for facility department. And usually, it is in a very small circle. When your product is very targeted, it's only a very small circle. You can look for them. Better still, if there's someone who knows them already. If you already know, let's say, you know, the person who organized Jamwon is, uh, for example, in charge of the... Uh, in charge of what? In charge of uh, uh, MACOM, for example, uh, marketing communication in UTHM. Uh, if you know the person already, the person usually organizes event. If this is your friend, you say, hey, I have the crepe. Do you think it's easier? Easier, right? Why is it easier? Because we know each other, we have rapport, right? So that's why. What's the meaning of rapport? Rapport means trust is there. So, I will come to branding and yourself because B2B, when a company is ABC Startup Sandrian Berhad, do you think people know the ABC Startup Sandrian Berhad? They don't know. They know you. Because they know you, then you become the brand that they recognize. It's not the ABC Startup Sandrian Berhad. So now, you find the people who has got problem that you can help to solve. Reduce their pain, improve their life, increase their profit, improve their productivity. So she will champion for you. Let's say the gardener. If you have the special service, you can clean all the padang padang very quickly. And then you have uh, all the landscaping, you have a special plant and all this. And then if the PPH, People like it, right? They will champion for you. Then they will go to the treasury. They say, hey, the budget this year, I can help you save the budget because this vendor is very good, right? Here, I'm talking about a very deep, I mean, the, the real value add, lah. not with under table. Lah. <laughs> because quite often, you know, sometimes it's different business culture. People say they want to benefit and things like that. But in this program, in the entrepreneurial development program, I really want to, because this is global, this is international. We're going to find customers globally. We cannot just use that kind of under-table tactic. Right? We must have real value add. We must help to increase the profit. 
solve the pain. So the person in the PPH can will champion, talk to the treasury, I want to get budget, the champion for you. She may be the recommender or the decision maker. So eventually, you need to also address the finance people, address the other decision maker, and then get the contract. That the solution can truly benefit your customer. Because quite often, people have forgotten. People say, hey, because I, I know the person, so he should help me. It's, it's the wrong idea. You see, now if I know the person, I have a crepe, but my crepe uh, is very, very hard. No? When people try one piece, uh, they really don't want the second piece. Even my good friend is a purchasing manager. Do you think my good friend want to buy from me? People blame him, no. Right? So I must have product that can serve the purpose. That it must be delicious. It's a rapo. Wow. I, it can melt in my mouth. It's so fantastic. Okay. Next. Yes. We're coming to an end already. Um, so, so even though we're going to sell crepe, there are 1,000 prospective customers in Bada Pahat. You identify 5 to 10 ideal customer, target customer, potentially friendly because you may know them and then personally committed to them because people want to see your own commitment it's not the ABC startup it's you so you say that okay you buy 100 tin of the crepe I'll make sure I deliver by next week and anything you call me 24 hours I will answer especially you know you talk about Mission critical products. I have a machine that help you track the production. Mission critical. They cannot just count on the support team. You yourself has to be accountable. That people trust you. So make yourself available. So it is a very rational process. Real, tangible, unmatched benefit to your customer. So if you want to be the company that can become successful globally, globally, I'm not saying just only in Bata Bahad, then it has to be one that gives real, tangible, and match benefit. The customer will validate the technology. They will tell you whether it's working well, it's not working well. And if the trust is there, then you respond quickly, that enhances the trust. Once they can trust you, they are going to be your reference. They will tell others when you call for a press conference, you invite them to come, they will say good things. That's how you spread. Why is it? It becomes words of mouth. It can be bad words also. No? Be careful. Right? So if it's lousy product, it becomes a words of mouth that spread faster than good words. Right? Yeah. Next. Trust. We talk about trust, right? And in fact, in my first lecture also, I share about trust. So, are you trustworthy? I, I want to quote Stephen Covey. When you are the brand of your company, you are the entrepreneur, you are the brand of your company. So, you got to be trustworthy. But what is the meaning of trustworthiness? First of all, you must have competency. Means you must have product that really can work. The crepe that is really nice rapo and, and and what do you call it crunchy crunchy okay good thank you tasty crunchy whatever name lah. and then the colors looks good it doesn't break the yeah packaging also good right when you open it's not hancho hancho so you must have the right product you have competency to produce pack it preserve it in the manner that is very presentable for jamwon then, the character is this, our own values. Our own values, our responsiveness, our honesty, this will work. It has to come in. When you combine these two factors, then the person becomes trustworthy. Let's say, for example, you have a very honest person, very honest, very, very good guy, very honest guy. But the product, what, the crepe, not the, not the crepe yang, yang, yang hancho, Gigi Ancho. Without the competency, do you think can sell? 
cannot, right? But if you have good product, this is the best scrap in the world, but you deal with him, he keeps scolding you, he, you know, he ridicules you, he says, this, I have my best product, you don't want, you don't, don't come and see me. If you show this attitude, do you think people will buy? People say, pergi lah kaya dengan scrap kamu ni. Yeah, right? So, the character and the competency, C and C, will make a person trustworthy. So, especially entrepreneur. I really cannot find one entrepreneur that has become successful because he's so good in cheating and cheating and cheating and cheating for 30 years. <laughs> I cannot find that. But I do have many friends enduring success because they have good character and they have good competency to deliver values in the products or services. Next. Okay. We also need to know the level of authority when we sell to a company, right? If we talk to a department manager, maybe they can approve 10,000, okay? up to 50,000. If you talk to an executive or user, maybe they don't have authority to approve anything. So when it comes to B2B sales, we want to know who has what kind of authority to make what kind of decision. So work with them and also find out who else has got their authority that can approve this purchase. Sales, you need the purchase order to come out. Someone needs to approve. Even though you go to PPH, but there may be a purchasing committee that has got the, because it's one million ringgit worth of contract. They may have a committee. They may have tender. They may have whatever. So, who has got this? Let's say, if below 50,000, no need tender. Who can approve the 50,000? Is it VC plus Treasury plus the Department Head? You need to know that. What's the process in UTHM? Yeah? VC and the committee. Okay. So it's quite common in most of the organization that they have different hierarchy in terms of level of authority. So once we know this, or when we do not know, when we go to the company, talk to purchasing manager, talk to the marketing manager because our product is to suit their needs, right? So we ask them, who has the authority to do what? Find out. Alright? Next. Ah, okay, this is the second last slide, I think. Quite often, people say, why should I buy from you? There are another five people selling crepe. Ah, this is the objection. Very common. In life, we have more objection than no objection. Right? You want to do sales? Out of 10 customers, you have 8 objections. Maybe 2 will say, okay, I like this. 8 will say, they have reasons why they don't want to buy your product. It's objection. Some say, I have 5 other vendors. Lah. Why should I buy yours? Right? Some say, hey, other people, you have 15 ringgit satu tin. Ah. Other people only 12 ringgit satu tin. Right? So then, uh, or they say, others all 20 ringgit. Why you sell 15 ringgit? Maybe you give something of poor quality. All kind of objection, no. Or they say, the packaging, na macha ni, or you, hudo, ah. Objection. Right? They say, packaging, hudo. Right? Or you bring a read, they say, eh, krepet na hancho, the dalam ni. Product not well arranged. It's objection. Alright? He say, oh, uh, you order 100 carton, tomorrow I can send 20, next week I send another 30, another week I send another 30, another week I say 20. He said, your delivery schedule cannot pakai. I want one go, 100 by next week. It's an objection. Objection can come in many forms. Delivery, packaging, service, price, quality, all kind of objection. So do I do the objection? Uh, objection. Then we don't have the sales. Right? So is objection good or bad? Hey, really? Uh? Please everyone give her objection. <laughs> you like objection? Ah, okay. 
yeah, o- objection is indeed very difficult to swallow. Very bitter. Very bitter. Drink. Very bitter objection. But, you're right. Objection, actually it helps us build our character. When people scold us, we build our character. Like Socrates said, uh, again, uh, this is not to belittle any group. Uh. Um, Socrates said, if you have a good wife, you can have a very happy family. Right? If you have a not so good wife, then you can become a philosopher. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so build character and also we improve our products and services. Because the feedback, objection, this is where we can overcome that objection by improving ourselves, then chances that they will trust us more. And then we can also have a better offering to other customers. So don't be afraid of objection. Objection is the one that cripples a lot of people. Before they go to see customer, they think, oh, what if they don't want how? What if they complain how? They cripple. They are crippled by the fear of being objected and being rejected by people. Next. Right, I think uh, I have talked about B2B sales, right? B2C, I'm not going to that, but just one slide to show that for B2C, you want to sell to consumer, it's a very different process. You can have retail, your open shop. You know, just now, you can have one, your industry kampong to do crepe, no need shop because you go out there and see the factory or business or UTHM, right? But B2C, usually you need some retail presence or internet business model with some form of e-commerce or affiliate model or marketplace. Or you can go multi-level marketing. You say, okay, you ask your friend, you sell for me, I give you 30%. I also don't have shop. But your friend, you go and sell, right? Your friend sell to your friend's friend, your friend's friend. So everyone gets some cut. You design that. So it becomes a little bit like informal multi-level marketing. Right? Or franchise, I put it very loosely. If I'm good in doing this, but I cannot market, so someone else who can market, you put your own brand, my crepe, I may call it best crepe Sian Bahat. But because I cannot sell, I franchise lah. You you have your brand. Your brand is called fantastic crepe. Fine. You go and sell under your brand. That's also another way, right? And this is for B to C. I'm not going to the detail. B to C has got totally different approach, totally different opportunity, totally different challenges. And the good news is this. On one hand, it is very difficult to sell B to C in a big scale. However, the most successful and the biggest companies in the world, all of them, without fail, all of them, will have B2C. You know, we, what is the most valuable company in the world? Which one? Apple. Apple, is it B2C or B2B company? B2C, eh? They sell to a lot of corporate customers also, but their approach is totally B2C. Because B2C is the one that can scale a lot. You are addressing the world's largest population. I mean, you're talking about out of 7 billion, you, you only address the top 20%. What's the size? Out of 7 billion, top 20%, how many? Low? Yes? 7 billion, eh? 20%. Yeah. Sorry? 7 billion and then? No, no. 7 billion is total. Call 20%. How, how can it be? 140. 140 billion is a lot bigger than 7 billion. Huh? 
is, is, is that what? 1.4 billion, that's right. So 1.4 billion is a lot, no. 1.4 billion is a lot if you target only the top 20%. It's already a lot. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop here. Any question? Yeah, we are opening for the quest, uh, Q and A session. Please. Yeah. Is there any question from the floor? There is a mic microphone in the middle. You can go there, and please introduce yourself and uh, your faculty as well. Come on, guys. Is there any question? Yes, Dr. Go. Uh, good morning, Dr. I'm Dr. Go from um, Faculty of Electrical Engineering. Um, I have a question here. Um, it's regarding uh, now the conditions of uh, doing business in Malaysia or throughout the world is actually a lot of uncertainty, actually. For example, like the, for example, like the weekends of Bringit Malaysia. And then how, how do we actually induce the challenge, challenges in order for us to actually move on? Thank you, uh, Dr. Go. Um, good time versus bad time. Right? Whether uh, can you be more successful during good time compared to bad time? Is there any answer to that? Uh, in good time, do you think there are companies going bankrupt? Yes, right? In bad time, do you think there are companies going bankrupt? Yes. Why is it in good time there are companies going bankrupt? All kinds of reasons, right? Mismanagement, wrong product, obsolete kind of technology, and, and many other reasons, right? Uh, in bad time, do you think there are... Uh, in good time, do you think there are successful companies? In good time. Yes, right? In bad time, do you think there are successful companies? Yes, right? Uh, Red Tone, I want to use the example of Red Tone, the company that I founded 21 years ago. We actually spent about 20 million in R&D to do the communication server. It's like unified communication. In a server, you can have phone system connected to it, email, voicemail, fax mail, phone directory in one. It was out in 2000, year 2000. And we had a grant from the government, 6.7 million grant. The other parts, we use our own money to do the R&D. Dot-com crash in the year 2000. The world went into recession, not just Malaysia. The world went to recession. People usually will buy the phone system, the PBX, the phone system. They stop buying. Lay off people. And they have a lot of excess ports. There are a lot of second-hand PBX being sold in the market. So, we also cannot sell our communication server. It's supposed to be the most advanced at that point in time. But we have our problem. Most advanced, but not stable. New technology hasn't reached the level of stability yet. So we have some customers, but we couldn't get to the level of high uh, customer satisfaction level. And recession already hit. Nobody is buying anything. And we have 160 people as an organization. It's actually a very heavy burden at that point in time. So what do we do? We have no choice but to scale down the business operation to less than 100. But more important is this. In a bad time, people have different needs. What's their need at that point in time? Because we are addressing B2B market. What is it that companies would want to achieve during bad time? To survive. Great. How to survive? To save costs, right? Where, do, where can it save costs? 
Reduce headcount is one. Reduce their utility bills, phone bills. Those days, telephone calls. You want to make outstation calls, you want to call to mobile, you want to call international. Very expensive. Right? They want to save on phone uh, expenses. You look at the top 10 items in the profit and loss account. You go through one by one and see which one I can help the company to save costs. If I can help them save costs, that will be my opportunity. So we identify that we can help them save telephone costs. We modify that communication server to become a smart call server. When people make a phone call, it will be routed through uh, a cheaper call. So we give saving to the company, 50% saving, 60% saving, 70% saving. So if the phone bill is 10,000, they say 50% means they say 5,000 a month. 5,000 a month is 60,000 a year. It's a lot of saving. So when we reposition ourselves, repackage our technology to become smart call server, during bad time, we saw the sales move like this. From 12 million a year, when we reposition, it was 14 million a year, it was 30 million a year, it was 80 million and 150 million and so on. This is how the, the curve was like. Because during bad time, people need to save costs and we then package our product to help them save costs. So we became the number one discounted call service provider in Malaysia. Then we re began to replicate this service in Shanghai, in, in Pakistan and so on. Right. So bad time, there's a timing for solution to address bad time. The timing for good time is different. In fact, for good time, usually it's more competitive. Bad time, in some areas, people thought there's no opportunity. When you can do it well, uh, there's a good opportunity. Discounted call, there were like 10 people doing it. But how do we break out and become number one? It was because we have core competency in our own technology. We can package that. The other people don't have. The way they buy some, some uh, simple router and they cannot reconfigure, no flexibility. So then it is very uh, hard for them to respond to different needs of the customer. Right? So timing for bad time, there'll be some opportunities. We look hard enough how to provide values in bad time. I hope that. <laughs> right. Any other question? Any other question from the floor? Yes, please. Uh, very good afternoon, Dato. Uh, I'm Shoban from Faculty of Engineering Technology. Okay, first of all, it's uh, not really a question. It's just like uh, seeking for some advice from you. We actually uh, engineers here in general. So. As a fundamental idea that um, getting involved in entrepreneurship, we have the course uh, entrepreneurship in UTHM here, which is very good uh, so that it become a, some basic idea so that we can explore uh, the markets in the future. So I really seek for your word of wisdom for the, for the engineers here to step into the field of entrepreneurship. That's, that's all. Yeah, you're calling everyone to also open their minds uh, to explore the path of entrepreneurship, right? Yeah, uh, this is what the whole series of talks uh, are meant to be. Yeah. It's to arouse the interest because quite often people think about uh, when I study, I want to go out there and work, which is good, right? And have a stable life and that's it, and retire. It is quite common to have this uh, thinking, which is a, uh, a, a necessary and also good thinking, right? Uh, a lot of people have the fear to start a business to be an entrepreneur. So we want to open this uh, option 
open this option in, in your mind that uh, to be an entrepreneur is also a good option. It's a different option. All right? Getting a good job is a good option. Again, it's a different option. Now, this one, I use the word different uh, because it will be a different path. And it's got its challenges, it's got its opportunities, it's got its excitement, it's got its hardship, that's for sure. Even if you work, it's the same thing. You want to be able to get to a level of, of significant, uh, what they call that, position. There are also a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of knowledge, a lot of learning, a lot of management of your own self and others. So they are equally, you know, a lot of effort as well. Right? So you can choose either path. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? This is lunch, lunch time, 12 30. Right? Is there any, any question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let that go. Um, Dato, one more question is um, what strategy does a startup company to attract? angel investor and later the venture capital to invest in the company? Uh, it's a funding question, right? Usually investor, whoever they want to invest in the company of a startup, right? They really want to see that first of all, this company has got a good team of people. Good team, it doesn't mean that everyone must have PhD only. Uh. Of course, a PhD will help. Uh. Good team means a good energy, strong motivation. The team comprise complementary skills. So first is to look at the people because startup means it will be subject to a lot of obstacles that the people need to overcome. So only the team could then find ways to overcome that. If the team is like, you know, not so motivated and all this, so usually the investors will, will be very worried to put any money, right? So the team, the motivation, the competency, the teamwork, especially the team who know each other for a long time. If you say, oh, I need a finance manager, so I go to the street and find, you know how to do the accounts, I'll be my finance manager. You, you have not even learned how to work together, no rapport, no trust and all this. The team is very loose. Chances that it can break easily. So usually they want to find whether, do you know, how long do you know each other? What brings you together? Why do you want to start this business? It's the people aspect, that's, that's one. Then secondly, the competency that can lead to the, the ideas. Behind the ideas will be the products and solution that can solve certain problem. And that, how big is the problem? that it has a certain scalability. If the problem is a big global problem, then you have big global opportunity, then it becomes scalable. So, the competency that can address a scalable market is also very important. Uh, yeah. uh, so, I think these are some of the important factors to consider. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. If there is no more question, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Dato. Thank you so much for the tremendous experience, for the great explanation, for the awesome knowledge from Dato. Okay, so on top of that, on top of everything, you have good product, you have great service, you have awesome, whatever it is, on top of everything, you have to put trust between you and your customer if you want to be a successful entrepreneur. Is that right, Dato? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to end our event for today and I would like to invite Associate Professor Tuan Haji Amran Muhammad Zaid, Deputy Dean Development and Industrial Networks, Faculty of Engineering Technology, to present our memento of appreciation to the Honorable Dato. Wei Chuan Bang, the founder and the managing director of Red Tone International Berhad. Please welcome.
Thank you so much Tuan Haji Amran and also thank you so much Datuk.